Hello, welcome everybody. Um, you should be at, if uh, you're at Hipster Cthulhu, you're at the right place. I'm not saying that in the authentic Lovecraftian style, but that's the way I'm going to say it because it's easier for me. Um, and uh, the description of the panel is, while Lovecraftian horror is firmly rooted in the period when Lovecraft created his mythos, authors and artists have been taking his pulp and existential horrors and updating them consistently throughout the decades. How do the Lovecraftian cliches mesh with each generation's new take on them? And so let's get right into uh, introductions. Um, I see, Nick, you're unmuted, so why don't you start and uh, we'll go from there. All right, I'm Nick Mamadas. I'm an author and anthologist. I've written Lovecraftian things for about 15 years now. Uh, maybe my first novel, Move Underground, recently reissued. It's like the original hipster Cthulhu story because it's the Beats, Jack Kerouac, Neil Cassidy, and William S. Burroughs in the Lovecraftian environment. Um, a few years after that, with my friend Brian Keene, I wrote The Damned Highway, which is Hunter S. Thompson, uh, reading Lovecraftian baddies and whatnot uh, during the 1972 presidential election. And most recently, I uh, created this anthology, Wonder and Glory Forever, which has Victor Laval, Molly Tanzer, Michael Sisko, other great writers, all focusing on Lovecraftian fiction that it has an emphasis on the an emphasis on the sublime as opposed to just the uh, scary and frightening. So it is kind of a new generation and a new way of conceptualizing Lovecraft. And that's what I've been up to, wasting my life. Very good. Um, so to, uh, we'll go to, uh, not wasting your life, I will. Ruthanna, could uh, you uh, tell us about yourself? Hi, I'm Ruthanna Emrys. I'm the author of the Inns of Legacy series, Wintertide and Deep Roots, which I have neglected to have next to me. So you can imagine me holding up a lovely book. Um, I am also relevantly for this panel, the co-blogger with Anna M. Tillsworth of a series of short story read throughs that started as Lovecraft reread and has recently switched over to being reading the weird as we have gotten through all the Lovecraft stories and have been reading weird and Lovecraftian fiction from 1800s through things that are just barely out <laughs> and we've been doing that for over six years now. <sighs> Lisa. Uh, hi, I'm Lisa Paddle. I'm coming in through gaming. Um, I've edited most recently Eldridge, New England, if you want to play children in Lovecraftian New England. <laughs> and yes, the scenarios are a lot gentler. Um, and I have worked on uh, the Delta Green material for Arc Dream, which is, I wouldn't recommend children uh, play that one. Uh, also, with Anna, I have on uh, the PDF of Unwanted, because uh, she also wrote a game about Lovecraftian horror. I wrote a little piece of the game. <sighs> it counts. Congratulations. So, I, I wrote the little scenarios, the you know, illustrations of the towers and so on, which is, for me, the fun part of writing a game book. Excellent. But I didn't make up the sheet. So I am uh, Tom Doyle. I'll be your moderator this evening. Um, I am the author of the American Craftsman Trilogy from Tor Books, which took a lot of the uh, canon of the uh, American uncanny from the uh, 19th and early 20th century and put it into a mash to kind of create an American uh, mythos of magic. And Lovecraft and Cosmic Horror does get into that view. I'm also most recently the author of Border Crosser, a psychological space opera where um, the uh, uh, involving revenge and the woman secret agent trying to gain control of her own mind again, and currently working on a sixth century BCE secret agent series. So, um, but yeah, let's get right to uh, Lovecraft questions. I have stuff that I've targeted at each of you individually, you know, as a, the starter person that then the rest of the panel 
can go down as usual. And I'll start with a question on um, what sort of updates and how difficult is the update in terms of language and style of, you know, we have Lovecraft in the, uh, the original Lovecraft stories have a certain very Baroque, very distinctive style. Um, but there have been updates in that. And I'm going to start with Nick on that since he just showed us some very interesting kind of time period and style shifts in both time period and style. Um, and I'd like to hear some more about those. I guess for my own projects, the idea was back when I was young and naive that I would do nucleic exchange between some different voices and styles and Lovecraftian material. Explicitly so, because like, uh, I found many people didn't like Lovecraft as a writer. They thought he was a bad writer, and I didn't think so. But I also thought, aha, there's a there's a market segment in there that I could probably exploit, which I did not manage to do at all, honestly. Uh, and so by taking Kerouac's voice in Move Underground, Kerouac is the, is the main character and the narrator. So it's written in my attempt at a pastiche of Kerouac's voice. And a lot of Lovecraftian pastiches are in Lovecraft's voice. So that was something I was trying to do that was a bit different and the same with um, The Damned Highway. It is written as if Hunter S. Thompson with his gonzo journalism style is the writer of the book. And that my friend and uh, Brian and I found this book at some point and published it. That's the, the conceit. Um, since then, I've turned a corner and I'm now trying to convince people that Lovecraft is a good writer. And people think he's not a good writer because when they read the wrong stories and they read them too fast and they don't realize what's going on in the stories. Lovecraft had a lot of voices in his stories. He wrote uh, in a fashion of a 17th century and 18th century um, dilettante in 19th and 20th century intellectuals. He's written as like Vermont hillbillies um, newspaper articles. He uses a lot of voices in his stories to sort of make a case for the supernatural occurrences. So that's why you can read journal articles, newspaper articles, letters between them, oh, they killed my dogs again, you know, like in, in uh, Whisper in Darkness. And he uses those that polyphony to build his case. Uh, subsequent to that, a lot of people who write Lovecraftian pastiche tend to say, yeah, I'm writing a Stephen King style horror story, straightforward third person, and just blah, tentacles at the end. And I think that is part of why there's been some, uh, part of why Lovecraft has a poor reputation because his epigenes, his, uh, his imitators, don't imitate him well or anybody else well. Yeah, I will go along with Nick in speaking for uh, Lovecraft's original prose style, although I do think it's a very specific taste that I don't blame everyone for sharing. It also varies tremendously between his stories. He was a very fast writer who did not do a lot of editing. So you have some things that are really not his best days and that he stuck in whatever amateur press would take it. And he has some things that are absolute masterworks of a certain sort of manic, manically anxious $10 vocabulary. And you don't really appreciate the level of energy that that brings to it until you read someone trying to do it and failing. But, you know, I, I have a certain appreciation as someone who is not as ongoingly stressed as Lovecraft, but who does definitely, my vocabulary gets more esoteric as I get stressed. And so you can kind of see that there, but he's also very self-aware of it. He has at least a couple of stories in which he uses the word cyclopean 11 times. We counted. <clears throat> and so he's clearly aware that that is something of a signature there. Um, in terms of other people adapting the voice, I think that most stories work best when they do get adapted to an author's own voice. I've seen very little in the way of pastiche that is trying to do Lovecraft that actually succeeds in it, whereas I've seen quite a lot of everything from the most Hemingway-ish telegraphic speech to people taking on wholly different sorts of 
energy. Um, I do think the Hunter S. Thompson take on it is one that works uh, particularly nicely. Uh, Nick, I'm afraid I haven't had a chance to look at yours on that yet, but I loved Fiona Mae's Geist's Red Star's White Snow Black Metal from the Ashes and Entropy um, anthology, which is also uh, gonzo journalism take on, um, actually on the King in Yellow and is absolutely brilliant. <sighs> Lisa, thoughts? Uh, yeah, so um, it's just like every generation reinvents Shakespeare. I'm not saying Lovecraft was Shakespeare, but every generation reinvents Lovecraft, which is good. Um, I've playtested a scenario, I do not know if it will see print, called All Along the Watchtower. Said at the Democratic Cre uh, Convention in 1968, Hunter S. Thompson is a player character in it. And it turned out the person who got that character had done research on Thompson and said, you have picked the one period of time where, yes, he was like this, because before he was in this way and after he was in that way. And I really hope it sees print someday because it is beautiful. There's one where, which is in print, I am blanking on the name, where you can play Robert Heinlein or his wife, or Philip K. Dick, who in our run turned into a giant lizard, which seemed somehow appropriate. Um, Joanna Russ wrote a story called My Boat, one of my favorite weird Lovecraft stories, because she goes off into the dreamlands on a complete tangent. Lovecraft could never have written it, and it could never have been written without Lovecraft. There's one story... So years ago, I read the Illuminatus trilogy, oh God, decades ago now, and it blew my mind open. And at the back, there's this reference to George Dorn, a character in the book, having an older brother who had an adventure with dolphins in an anthology of, of Call of Cthulhu stories. Now, it turns out this anthology was published in two very different forms. And the form I found at first had Joanna Russ's story, but didn't have the dolphin story. And so I finally tracked down the version that has the dolphin story. And in it, there is a professor who used to be a hippie and it is written the way Lovecraft would have written it and it is brilliant because this guy caught it and is spoofing it perfectly. You would not think it, said the hippie to me, to look at me, but once I too was a professor in academia. <laughs> and I love it. Um, Charles Strauss reinvented things for the laundry and I love the laundry books. I love the laundry role-playing game where he has this one-page short short that Strauss himself wrote saying, no, Bob, no one's going to eat you, but we need you to look into this role-playing game thing. They've spilled all our secrets. You need, you need people? Okay, go to uh, the zombies. You need live people? We, we have a budget here. I mean, what people forget is Lovecraft was writing as modern as he could for his day. It is fine to modernize. In fact, please modernize. So um, I was going to go to uh, Ruthanna next with a target, you know, put a target on you and your little Zoom box there. Um, you have an interest in how, you know, the sort of uh, the tie of cosmic horror to the various concepts of uh, how this reality might be extinguished or at least life on earth or life as we know it. Um, what do you see happening in, uh, in that respect over the last uh, century or so? Uh, so one of the things, I, I, I first started thinking about this because of Strauss's laundry series and the ways that he pointed out that the rise of the elder gods maps really, really well to apocalyptic nuclear war. And at first it was very hard for me to get my head around how did Lovecraft write so well about the feeling of the Cold War when he did not live to see the Cold War. And then going back and reading his stuff, I could see how that came very directly out of World War I and out of the first intimations that people were having with that war, that our weapons were beyond 
people coming together in a battlefield and were things that could be a threat to the whole species. And you start seeing um, other literature that way as well. Um, there Will Come Soft Rains, I believe, is post-World War One. even though I always thought of that as a Cold War poem when I was a Cold War kid, too. Um, but so you, you get this whole mythos that comes out of World War I and out of that sense of the threats to humanity becoming something more than human and more than human control. And then post-World War II, you start to get more of that sense that it's, come, it's mapping to nuclear war. And Strauss really brings that to the fore, even more so than the Lonzi series. The Coldest War is one of the most chilling mythos stories that I have ever read. Um, and now you're starting to see, and in fact, the Longley series has done this, it getting mapped more to climate change. And where Strauss started writing this Cold War thing, now he has this line about, um, I can't remember the term that he uses for his apocalypse, um, but that it's not an event, it's a time period. <laughs> And so you are now having these Lovecraftian apocalypses that are more that incremental, it's already happening. You can maybe do damage control, but it could go to very bad places and already is in very bad places and maybe people aren't even noticing as much as they should. And just the way that it continues to map makes me think about the way that that's this very intense part of every modern and postmodern experience that we've had for the last hundred years has been that awareness of potential apocalypse and extinction. Mm -hmm. Before anyone follows <laughs> up. <laughs> that is the term I'm looking for. <laughs> Before anyone follows up on uh, what Lisa just said, um, for uh, attendees, if you have questions be sure that you want the panelists to address eventually, please put them in the Q&A instead of the chat where we can kind of skim the chat function, but it's, it's easier as far as uh, when we, uh, and if you've already said something that you would like to be a question to the panel, please put that in the Q&A instead of the chat. So uh, uh, thoughts on what, uh, other thoughts on the apocalypse uh, and connection to our cosmic horror from the other panelists. I'm against the apocalypse. I, I would, we don't have yeah. but, but that is, is that, but yeah, is that difficult being around, right? in your in your genre. I mean aren't you supposed to be for the apocalypse when you're writing about these cultists a little bit, you know? You know, on some level I think so, uh, because nothing's more dissatisfying than a Lovecraftian story with a happy ending. <laughs> oh we, we say here the day, hooray. And that feels uh, a little bit of a cheat. But of course, at the a same time, if every, Lovecraftian story, if every Lovecraftian story ends with a, with a bad ending, with a world ending, then, it, then there's nothing surprising about it. You know, imagine an anthology of Lovecraftian stories where, well, the world ends again. Oh, what's going to happen in this story? Ends again. So uh, one thing that people are doing is, is trying to uh, localize and personalize Lovecraftian stuff too. Caitlin Kiernan does this really well. You know, her, a lot of her stories that are very weird or touch on Lovecraft are about uh, individual transformation, um, issues of, of gender and identity in existential ways, personal apocalypses in the dual term of destruction and also tearing away the veil, revelation. Mm -hmm. And that's one way I think to, uh, to not use Cthulhu as either the big sledgehammer that ends the, and how do I end the story? I know I'll turn the story over, I'll turn over the playing field, turn over the chessboard and put a Cthulhu in there instead of the kings and queens. Uh, or just make Cthulhu a monster with hit dice. Oh, I, I got it with my lucky sword. That's a that's a for Cthulhu. Take care of that. Lisa, you and now are just I'm hearing that buzz in your voice, and I think you're outed as amigo here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. Uh, so, sorry, what was the question you were asking? So I'm asking about you know 
the sorts of apocalypses that uh, the cosmic horror points to, you know, over the last century was the sort of. So you get climate change in the Ballad of Black Tom, which I highly, highly recommend. Um, Lovecraft himself, any given story is actually as likely to have a relatively happy ending as an unhappy ending. In gaming, you get this interesting tension. Uh, players generally want to win, even if they're voluntarily signing on for a horror game. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes they, they really are looking forward to losing big, but they're not going to play to lose because where's the fun in that? So you need to have victory and defeat on the table. And a lot of scenarios <clears throat> would classically wimp out by saying, We've put a world-shaking uh, threat on the table. If they lose, that's why the world is in the state it's in today. And if they win, that's why the world's no worse than that. And, and that's a little dissatisfying. <laughs> um, one of the scenarios I edited for Delta Green, which is a modern day setting, um, it's called Observer Effect. And it is beautiful and so, so bleak. And I edited it right after the 2016 election, and I needed that one to cheer me <laughs> up. Um, it's victory is possible, defeat's possible, and there is a way to continue the campaign without undoing what's been done. It, it walks the line beautifully. But you can also get scenarios where what's at stake is smaller, just like in the stories. Rats in the Walls, um, Lovecraft at his best and worst simultaneously. The stakes are very small. Uh, you can get what's at stake is there's a young boy who happened to come across an amulet of summoning bad things. He's not going to end the world, but he could accidentally kill his family. Can you get to him on time? You know, uh, I think yeah, about... I Oh, come on. Sorry. One of the things that does give the mythos its power, and I think this is one of the things that when people adapt it is really necessary to make it work well, is that it could go either way. Because if you have predictable, everything's going to go bad, always the world ends, then you still have a predictable, consistent universe. And part of cosmic horror is that the universe is neither malevolent nor interested in human survival. And I think the failures are often when you have elder gods who are particularly interested in or dependent on human sacrifice, or when you know that things are definitely going to work out one way or another, but it's still human centric like the world ends because the world is important as opposed to the world ends because the world isn't actually mm. all that important in the scheme of things mm. so um lisa you, you've kind of addressed this uh, some of this already but uh i'm interested in how and and you've given some examples but i'm interested in some others of how you compress uh you know the sense of you know, timeless, undying, and in universe in different horrors into uh, you know a game being played, you know, on a very on a more micro level with uh, individuals and such. And you know, you're not pulling in big special. You know, it's in the it's in the imagination. How do you compress the cosmic into an RPG? I guess short answer. That depends. There are many ways. Slightly longer answer. Yeah. Um, what am I running? If I'm running my current campaign, a Trail of Cthulhu campaign called Eternal Lies, one of the things some of the players are loving is this is a campaign where, yes, there is one particular outer god, elder god, whatever you want to call it, behind the scenes, but the focus is very much on the humans, on human cultists, on what this is doing to the investigators and the people closest to them. And the cultists are arguing among themselves over which god it is they're worshiping again. And the players love that the cultists are no more clued in than they are. Um, at another end of the spectrum, one of the games I had the great fortune to play test, Fate of Cthulhu. Okay. 
you're not playing that kind of cosmic horror. You're playing basically Terminator. <laughs> there is no, you lose sanity. There's, you get more corrupted if you use mythos technology, if you, you know, maybe go back in time to try to stop uh, the Cthulhu apocalypse or the Haster apocalypse. The GM creates a timeline or uses one that's in the book. Um, you tweak it in play based on what the characters do. And so it's an apocalypse you've created for this game. And if everybody liked it so much they want to do it again, well, you may have made this better, but can you make it better still? Or will something different come in and cause the apocalypse this time? Uh, you, you have so many options, J just as any author does. Are you writing a story about um, someone going into the dreamlands? Are you writing a story about discovering that your father was a cannibal? Are you writing a story that, oh my God, my neighbor who I think I've got a crush on is doing math that could end the universe. Do, do I kill him? Do, do, do I just let the universe end? Uh, I, I need a memo on this. And I've got a performance review coming up on Friday. You brought up points, and that's a place where I think that the treatment of things has changed a lot over time. Um, Lovecraft's own stuff was very caught up in issues of mental illness. It was a thing that he was terrified of because of family history. Um, and when, when he writes, you can see actually recognizable PTSD and anxiety disorder um, going on, but you can also see that there's very much what a uh, modern reader would consider to be fairly hideous ableism that is partly of the time and partly of Lovecraft in particular. And seeing how modern writers have handled that ranging from turning it into a joke or a very stereotyped thing with madness to changing around entirely the the mental changes that are underlying the horror. So you talked about corruption. I've seen a lot of modern games play with that. I just finished this afternoon um, reading I'm going to mispronounce his name terribly. Joey Clark as uh, Ring Shout, which is rather than having sanity being the underlying issue, has bigotry and hatred being what lies behind the cosmic horrors that are. Uh, taking advantage of the second rise of the Ku Klux Klan. Um, and that was an absolutely brilliant handling of that that was following a completely different mental and emotional horror than concerns with mental health. Mm. Um, Nick, uh, any thoughts? whether in uh, RPGs or otherwise about how to, uh, how to bring in the, uh, the cosmic and the, the cosmic horror into, uh, you know, a, uh, the uh, more narrow setting. How do you pack that in to your stories or remove the snacks from the gaming table? What's that? Remove the snacks from the gaming table. <laughs> and drink the side conversations and make it a more unpleasant experience generally <laughs> once or twice and i think uh, it'll raise the tension enough to make people upset and uh, make mistakes and feel that they have an agency when they don't and that's really the core of uh cosmic heart and gaming it's like oh, i think i can do this this is going to be great i'm going to have a moral victory i'm going to have some kind of moral victory and actually you're not and uh, if you also just make the gaming experience a little uh, harsher, it all, it often works better that way. That's been my experience anyway. Does that lead to the Lovecraftian cannibal stories? Does that lend itself? Well, people bringing their own snacks next time, and they realize, oh shit, he's not bringing, he's not giving us snacks. We gotta take care of our own business. <laughs> so, um, 
there's a question in the q and I'd like to get it because this seems an appropriate segue for that. And I also get to plug a, another a friend on this uh, question. What do you think of the humorous takes like Little Cthulhu or Cthulhu Chick Track? And I would like to uh, uh, mention a uh, friend and author, Alex Schwartzman, who writes stories like uh, telling grandma about Cthulhu and uh, uh, he has uh, some humorous takes on, um, he does humor well, and he has some uh, takes on cosmic horror in his humorous stories that are that are funny and uh, with still a sense of menace, you know, in the periphery. But what do you guys uh, think of uh, the humorous side of Lovecraft? I have five plushy Cthulhu's. Ah, there you go. <laughs> I just had to stop and count through them all. Let's see. The two regular ones. Okay, one's technically my husband's. Um, one small one, Cthulhu in black and little Cthulhu in black, you know, with the little briefcase and the tentacles creeping out of it. I love the movie Little Cthulhu. Um, humor has its place. Heck, Lovecraft on a good day could be hilarious on purpose. Um, at the same time, so Cat Valente wrote a story whose name I am blanking on. And as a story, it's hilarious. It's funny. I'm glad she wrote it. As a critique on Lovecraft, she's missing the point. Um, there, as Nick said, yes, Lovecraft could write very well. He could also write very badly. Um, if you're playing in my game, there's going to be humor. Um, we're humans. That it, It's what we do. Hopefully, you will not be trying to undercut everything I'm doing, because if you are, we're in the wrong game, and we need to have a conversation about, is this a game you actually want me to run? But again, same thing with stories. Where are you going with it? If you're going to Little Cthulhu and how Haster's not such a bad guy after all, I'm totally there for it. Ruthanna? Hello, Ruthanna? Hello. Uh, it's Lovecraftian comedy is, it can be really good, but for me at least, it's very hard to get right. I think that it has to be exactly on voice and to know the thing that it's making fun of, because like Lisa said, if you're making fun of the wrong thing, then it can fall a little bit flat. Um, if you're making fun of the right thing, then it can be hilarious. I'm not going to give this a good examples of either. As I said, it's not the area that I tend to focus on most, although ironically, my very first published piece, not um, not pro at all, was a Lovecraftian humor short story about the Elder Gods coming back and being absolutely horrified by the Cthulhu fleshies. <laughs> Nick, uh, you, you seem to have a sense of humor about Lovecraft. What, uh, what do you have to say uh -oh. about it? You know, as part of the question of humorous horror and humorous fantasy in general, and a lot of it really just in my reading fails because it's based on puns and kind of goofiness as opposed to humor and the very, very broad comedy as opposed to uh, interesting focus comedy. You know, what, what makes something funny when I'm a reader is not a wacky name or a, a funny experience for characters who are normal characters who are telling jokes or trying to release some tension by being funny as we are in real life. Even if you're in prison, there are jokes in prison. Even if you're on the unemployment line, there are jokes on the unemployment line. But this kind of uh, fantasy wankiness, I dislike a lot. For me, uh, a couple of the funniest Lovecraftian novels were from the 90s, both by William Browning Spencer. One is Resume with Monsters, about a guy who uh, has sort of a Pulp Fiction Lovecraftian encounter while working at a copy shop uh, that does resumes and business letters and uh, business cards and that kind of thing. And one called Irrational Fears, which is hard, very hard to find these days, but definitely worth it, which uh, sees Lovecraftian menace 
and cultism inside the 12 steps programs like AA and NA. And Spencer was, has gone through the 12 steps. So it's not like he's an outsider of either of these things. And they're both very funny and very dark, like black comedy and the humor of situation as opposed to the humor of, I'm going to name my kid, you know, HP hate craft, take that, you know, that, that kind of thing that we see a lot. Yeah. Of. Yeah. I mean, like one of Charles Strauss's laundry books, there is a vampire scrum meeting and it's hilarious. And my husband, who is a computer programmer, was rolling on the floor, assuring me this is exactly how scrum meetings go. Mm -hmm. And the book is not a funny book as a whole. It, it ends with a very, very sad scene. Not tragic, not earth ending, just, you know, you're like, oh. but even within there, there, there is room for humor. So I thought we could uh, also look at uh, some of the other media. We've talked about RPGs. We've talked about some of the novels and stories. Um, kind of interested in uh, the visual uh, arts and the visual mix, uh, graphics uh, like uh, uh, Providence, uh, movies, TV shows, um, you know, which, what, whichever uh, and whoever would like to go first and have something they want to talk about in, in the more visual medium and realis recent realizations of Lovecraft. I, I'd love to hear about that. I'm a fan of, of, of several of those. So. Hello Cthulhu. It's a graphic novel. I'm hoping there's going to be another graphic novel in this world um, about a woman who is Haster's daughter. Um, and who does not want to do what Papa Haster wants her to do and has found, as far as we can tell, a baby Shuggoth. And it is so cute. But the story is very serious. She is patrolling her block, trying to keep things with tentacles from eating the neighborhood kids. She is being stalked by a local slayer type um, who quite understandably wants to make sure the world doesn't end. Um, I forget who wrote it, but it's Kala, C-A-L-L-A, -L -L -A, Cthulhu. Um, there's Fall of Cthulhu. Um, and again, I am blanking on the author. There are graphic novel versions of a lot of Lovecraft stories. Yes, there's Providence. Um, Providence is amazing. It will not be to everyone's taste. Um, there is no way it could. There was a silent 2005 uh, movie of Call of Cthulhu done in black and white, like an old silent um, thing. And it's very well done. There's a movie of Whisperer in Darkness that makes a lot of changes to it, but for what it is, it, it's again very well done. Um, I confess I have not seen Lovecraft Country. I've read the book, and I now have the DVDs for it, so I can see it one of these days. Yeah, I have seen uh, these first few episodes of Lovecraft Country. I thought it was brilliant. Um, I don't get a lot of TV watching time these days. Is why I have not finished watching it, but I do plan to. And I thought it did an amazing job of honestly improving on the book in having some, you know, Misha, Misha Green caught a lot of things that um, added a lot to it. I also have a bit of a soft spot for the weird campy stuff um, we have in reading the weird uh, tradition that every 50th post is on some sort of screen Lovecraft stuff. Uh, last time it was Lovecraft Country, but usually it's the campiest, weirdest thing we can find. So we've done Howard Lovecraft and the Frozen Kingdom, which is an animated movie in which young H.P. Lovecraft is the uh, the main character who is uh, running around having adventures with a very cute Deep One family who can also do ninja moves and 
um, Cthulhu as the animal sidekick. Uh, we've done a couple of different animes, one of which has Herbert West in a mech suit. Um, so th there's a lot of strange, fun stuff out there. Nick, on the uh, visual arts and the mythos. I thought. I'm not a huge fan of a lot of the films and such, but the one thing I liked quite a bit was Antarctica Express by Kenneth Haidt, which is uh, essentially uh, Mountain of Madness as a child's book, like a picture book. Uh, with a child protagonist who is taking up, in, like in like many child books, so, you know, they have a dream about going to some nice place, and this place is Antarctica, and uh, the events of Call of Cthulhu, or not, sorry, Mountains of Madness, uh, take over, and they, they're fine at the end, still kids, but he's sort of haunted at the end forever, and it's a very strange book, because it's not actually written for children, it's just written in the mode of a child's book for adults to know the story, but it still was very effective to my kid, when it was sent to him when he was three, and he he got a kick out. He just said it was a very strange book. He was like, why isn't this? Been... They're not saying goodnight and going to sleep at the end. Like all the books I ever read, you know, they get me to sleep. This is so strange. And so he had a, a weird experience with it. And I kind of liked uh, that that happened. There's a Dr. Seuss-esque uh, retelling of Call of Cthulhu where everything is in Seussian rhyme and illustrated. You've got this cultist assassin lurking, drawn exactly like a Dr. Seuss character would be. Um, occasionally you get some really weird things. There's... Um, Roger Corman film, I think The Haunted Palace, which is basically Charles Dexter Ward. Mm -hmm. And there was one bit that had my husband and I going, wait, you just, what? Because one of the characters, who is a nice, normal human doctor, suddenly says to the wife, I mean, you know, Cthulhu, yogg -Soth -Oth Dagan, I mean, we laugh at it now, but they really believed it. And we're like, wait, in what universe do normal doctors just rattle off these names like everyone knows them? And there's a, a disconnect because the rest of the movie fit perfectly. So uh, we had a question, um, Nick, uh, was it Antarctica Express was the name of the book? Someone couldn't hear it. The Antarctic Express. Antarctic Express. Very cool. The, yeah, the Antarctic Express. By Kenneth as you would spell it, height, H-I-T-E. Very cool. Um, let's see, here's an odd question. We can kick it around a bit. Um, it's comparing what would be kind of the one sentence pitch or elevator pitch for the original Lovecraft stories to uh, something uh, ones for uh, one sentence pitches or elevator pitches for uh, now. I'm not sure if, uh, or I guess maybe it's doing what the pitch would have looked like back then versus what a sort of revised pitch, a, a critical pitch would look like now for the same stories. I'm not sure. Um, any, uh, hmm. I'm not, uh, well, meditate on that one a little bit. Uh, are there interesting projects that you have going forward or that you're aware of coming out soon that we should be on the lookout for? in the Lovecraftian mythos. Uh, well, from our dream <clears throat> for role-playing games, Impossible Landscapes is already a PDF and will be coming out in print, I believe, in June. Um, it is more Chamberian than Lovecraftian, but it is amazing. I'm currently editing Britannia and Beyond, um, a source book for Cthulhu Invictus, which is itself a source book for Call of Cthulhu. You know, if you want to play uh, in Roman Britain fighting the mythos. And uh, worth mentioning, of course, the, the ch how the Chambers stuff came up in the uh, True de Detective series as far as recent visual. Um, with Anna, Anything you know of that's coming out or anything that you're doing or in that people should be on the lookout for as far as uh, Lovecraft or Cosmic Horror related? No one has sent me any arcs lately of things that aren't out yet. And my own 
latest project is uh, near future science fiction first contact and not especially Lovecraftian. Um, recent stuff, um, I've really enjoyed T. Kingfisher's riffs on weird fiction. We're doing the hollow places on the column right now as our long read. Um, and, and what's the what's the what's the hollow places uh, for those who might not be familiar? So T. Kingfisher uh, did this. It's a riff on Algernon Blackwood's *The Willows*, and it is some of the more delightfully terrifying stuff that I have read recently. Mm. So, and, and what's the Algernon Blackwood, just in case uh, people aren't uh, familiar? Uh, Algernon Blackwood's The Willows is a classic piece of weird fiction. Um, it's, it does not lend itself well to an elevator pitch. It's about a couple of guys on a nature trip, and there is something weird and maybe dangerous coming out of the willows on the island that they're staying at and it makes holes in things and uh, possibly it kills you if you get too close or thinking about it the wrong way. Um, the Hollow Places is a little more plotty. It's uh, about a woman who's staying with her uncle who runs one of these weird roadside attraction museums and find the hole in the wall of the museum and it leads to this strange landscape that is full of strange and potentially deadly things or worse than deadly things. <sighs> and yes, it, it is a uh, pseudonym for us so we've learned. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, Nick, anything you're aware of that's on our horizon? You know, I was to ask because uh... I used to get a lot of love crafting stuff sent to me saying, oh, you're going to love this. You're highly interested in this. And then a couple of years ago, I wrote a book called I Am Providence, which is about a murder mystery at a love crafting convention in which uh, essentially I am murdered. And uh, everyone I know is a suspect. And after that book came out, people stopped sending me things. So it worked. <laughs> but to answer the question that is in the Q&A, I think like uh, to summarize love crafting stories, I would say this is modern horror in a science fiction mode, meaning modern and doesn't have the morality of the 19th century where the bad people get theirs and the good people are saved via some thing. And you wouldn't need to change that part for the 21st century. It's still the same thing. Why Lovecraft is so compelling and why a lot of the other authors you know, writing weird tales haven't been uh, seen this renaissance is because his themes still talk to people today about um, the horrors of existence, um, I, uh, a universe that, as Ruthanna was saying, is not really out to get you, but doesn't care about you, which in some ways even worse. Right? It's not uh, hate is not the opposite of love. Uh, not not caring at all is, and that's what people really get to. And of course, Lovecraft was a you know a horrifying racist and ableist and anti-Semite, even more so than many other white Americans of the early 20th century. But uh, one can fruitfully read that kind of read his stuff without experiencing that for the most part, you know, unless we uh, find certain bits and pieces here and there. And the, the odd thing is that all his anxieties like that I was talking about generates the horror. Were he more well-adjusted, he'd be a less successful writer, which makes separating the art from the other very challenging. Like, oh, what if we just, what if he's just a normal guy? Like Tom Doyle with his refrigerator back there, he'd be, eh, he, he wouldn't be so good. <laughs> and that's sort of the thematic challenge of, of Lovecraft and pitching him to audiences today. I'll have you know yeah, that you have to the turret. So <laughs> his bigotries to, to me, they weave through so much of his stuff and are really inextricable because his fear of the thing, the fact that he could take these being afraid of other people and other groups of people and sometimes write about it directly in horrible ways and sometimes be turning it into monsters on the one hand it does mean i i don't think you can get away from it with any of his stuff but on the other hand it makes the mythos a really great way to write about bigotry itself as a 
horror, and a lot of uh, yeah. modern writers are doing that. Uh, we're we're going to have to uh, wind up with uh, last thoughts, if that's not your last thought. Uh, um, Lisa, do you have a? We're at the uh, the fifty minute mark. Uh, just quick last thought, or where they can find you and your work, I guess, would be great. Oh yeah, um, you can find me at Lisa Paddle on Facebook at Dr. C Punk D R C P U N K on Twitter and on Dreamwith. You can also find me and my husband occasionally rambling about role playing games at Lab Cats on Dreamwith. Just picture two cats wearing lab coats. Ruthanna? Oh, you wrote uh, the on chat. website in the chat. No, it's a good um, use of time. Thank you. Uh, Nick, Any? Uh, where can people find you? I've got a distinctive surname. So just type Mama Tassum to the search engine of your choice, and you'll get more of me than you can possibly ever consume. Uh, and that's one to pitch again, one bring glory forever, which uh, I think has a very interesting take on what we've been talking about in that it re relocates the fair into belonging. Because Lovecraft, like Ruthanna was saying, you know, hated the other people, hated the other, but also was strangely attracted to them. Again, it wasn't uh, this interest being got to the love, it was hate and love having a weird, helical uh, counter relationship. So he uh, writes about, you know, in, in Innsmouth, he hates these sea creatures, they're degenerate, they're awful, then he becomes one and it's great. Right? Wondering Glory Forever comes from the last line of, of that story. And that was what makes him incredibly compelling to this day. He, he loved what he hated. He wanted to do what he hated the most. Because he was well, I, I think I think we should uh, let our uh, uh, attendees go and our, our, our and free our tech person from this uh, chamber of horrors. But we will right. go to the Discord and uh, with further things to say. Thank you. You've all been marvelous. You can find me at tomdoyleauthor.com. Um, and, uh, and I'm on the usual social media. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Get vaccinated. Yep. Oh yeah. I've gotten my two and I've started to grow my tentacles. So I'm ready to join <laughs> the, old, the old ones. <laughs> Fantastic. Nicely done guys. Thank you so much. Thank you, Karen. Appreciate it.